the way I think about it is one part of the value of diversity. It's a strategy for catching the bacteria that you want. You know, let's let's imagine that there's some bacteria you want in your tank and some you don't. Well, if you if you catch very few bacteria, you probably haven't got all the ones you want, right? By catching more and more bacteria, by establishing a more diverse um, starting set of bacteria in your tank, you have a better chance of you know catching the ones that you want. Are you ready for our fourth and final installment of our series on aquabiomic testing? Because in this video, we reveal the results of the 125 gallon reef tank and we show you how to interpret the data so that you can make better informed decisions when it comes to the health of your aquarium. We're taking a deep dive into the world of aquabiomics and showing you just how you can see the overall health of your reef aquarium with this powerful tool. So tune in as we uncover the secrets of the unseen world of your reef aquarium's microbiome. go ahead and jump into uh, the results right now from the yeah, tank. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so <clears throat> I'll pull up the microbiome report here. Great. And so the first thing that we see once we get it back is a diversity score. So what, what does that mean? Um, I mean, I know green is typically good, so you probably want it in sure. the green. This one's a little low. So what, what does that mean for yeah. the tank? Well, you know, let's start by acknowledging that the, the color code there is sort of based on our recommendations, our assumptions. Um, we, we, we consider high diversity to be good, um, but, but really let's focus on the numbers, you know, the data themselves. Um, so diversity, simply the simplest way to understand this, it's just the number of different types of microbial DNA that we found in your sample. There's a bit more that goes into it. There's some corrections for differences in the total number of DNA sequences, but it's basically how many different types of DNA did we find in your sample? And um, you can see that we, we compare we compare that number, your diversity score, with all the other tanks in our database. We have this huge database at this point of all the all the healthy reef tanks that we've uh, studied, and we compare your sample with all of them to ask how does it compare? And you can see that yours was, um, what is that, the sixth or eighth percentile? Very low, right? So it was, um, you know, the, the majority of reef tanks that we've sampled had a had a lower, had a higher diversity score uh, than yours did. Um, okay. Now there's a lot of debate about how much does diversity matter? Why does diversity matter? Um, even if diversity is valuable, how much is enough? How much do you need? Um, these are questions that aren't completely settled among professional ecologists. They're certainly not settled among reef keepers. Um, you know, I think there's there's room for discussion and debate here. I think about this in some ways like, uh, like alkalinity. We can tell you how to measure it, but everybody has their own opinion on what is the best value that they want to maintain their tank at. And I think there's, you know, reasonable people can reach different conclusions there. My own conclusion is this in, in nature, I mean, there's over a century of study in ecology of diversity and in nature, diversity is generally associated with a more productive ecosystem and a more stable ecosystem, um, a resilient ecosystem. When it gets disrupted, it, it bounces back rather than crashing. These are all things associated in nature with, with higher diversity. And ecologists have spent a century arguing about why, you know, what's the mechanism? How does diversity help? Um, I sure don't have the answer to that question. The way I think about it is one part of the value of diversity. It's a strategy for catching the bacteria that you want. You know, let's, let's imagine that there's some bacteria you want in your tank and some you don't. Well, if you, if you catch very few bacteria, you probably haven't got all the ones you want, right? By catching more and more bacteria, by establishing a more diverse um, starting set of bacteria in your tank, you have a better chance of you know, catching the ones that you want. Now, uh, having said that, I have to acknowledge the obvious counterpoint that, well, you could catch the ones you don't want to. And I mean, I think that's where testing comes in. You know, let's not just grab 
water from every pet store tank in the hopes of maximizing diversity, let's think carefully about, you know, what we're putting in the tank. But yeah, that, those are my thoughts on diversity. You know, it's, it's generally, it's generally a, a positive thing in nature. I think it is also a positive thing in our tanks. Um, now let me take a little opinion out of that. Um, I said, I think it's a positive thing, but I think we've all observed that as, as a tank gets more mature, corals do better. So in other words, when you first start out your brand new clean reef tank, um, and you, you try to put a coral in there, it, it generally doesn't do well, you know, dry sand, dry rock, plop a coral in, and it's not going to do well. We've generally in the hobby observed that over time, something happens to the tank as it gets older, as it matures, uh, that makes it work better for corals, provide a better habitat for corals. We didn't know what that was. There was something we, wa we weren't measuring, but we've shown clearly in multiple experiments and other people have shown it too, that over time, what happens in a tank, you first establish a tank, it has very low diversity and that diversity gets established. It increases over time. If you start with live rock, you can get to a, a good diversity score within a month or so after starting a new tank. But in a new tank, diversity is low. And I think that's a, a good piece of evidence that, um, that diversity is beneficial because as diversity increases, the tank becomes more able to support corals. <clears throat> yeah, and I think a lot of times, um, either being new to the, the hobby or first setting up a, a tank, um, sometimes we might think that, oh, it's a water chemistry issue that our corals yeah. aren't doing well, when really our microbiome hasn't been established enough, or like you said, that there's not enough diversity in yeah. there for yeah. for the different functions that they do uh, to help your reef tank. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so the, the next thing um, after diversity that, that you look at is the balance score. Right. Um, and so. Yeah, and, and you're scored very high on balance. So, yeah, so um, this one. Mm -hmm. So balance, this is a measure <clears throat> of how similar is the microbial community in your tank to the typical microbiome in an established healthy reef tank. So we're. We're taking these two complex communities, comparing them and giving you one number, the balance score. That, that number is gonna range from zero if it's really, really different, all the way up to one if it's completely identical to the typical reef tank. Um, we take that score and again, compare it to all the other real tanks that we've tested and, and ask how does yours compare? You can see that yours was in the 92nd percentile. So, um, you had a higher score than 92% of the tanks we've tested. Very cool. This so it's pr pretty good. Very typical uh, okay. community. It, it's very similar to the mature reef tank uh, community. This is a very awesome. positive sign. Um, this is something that takes time to develop. You know, you can, you can rapidly achieve diversity by sort of putting a bunch of stuff in your tank quickly, like live sand, live mud, you can quickly get diversity. <clears throat> but this balance score, this, this always takes time to develop. This is really a measure of how mature the community is. Um, over time, we'll see one family rise to dominance and then kind of collapse and another family takes over. That process takes some time. And it's a lot like the same succession process that happens on land in terrestrial communities. If you've ever seen a, a field turn over the course of years from a field into a bunch of shrubs and then eventually into a forest, that forest is the long-term stable ecosystem. And the, the microbial community in your reef tank goes through a similar process. It's just invisible. You go through different stages as that community uh, matures. And what we're seeing in your tank with this very high score is uh, a tank that looks a lot like that mature long-term community, um, sort of the, the community analogous to a, a, an old growth forest on land. Very cool. And that's, and that's probably due to um, having my five-year-old tank and then moving everything over to start 
this repaint. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I think that's, you know, as long as the tank's healthy to begin with, right, not full of parasites, that's that's a great way. Why throw away all that progress you've made, you know, yeah. building that community over years? Yeah, very, very cool. And then uh, from there, you have the actual community composition. And this is um, the, the makeup of the tank, all the different bacteria that's living within your tank. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And this um, this picture, this really focuses on the water uh, sample and compares it to the the typical uh, profile in other water samples. And, you know, looking at it, I think visually your sample is just kind of obviously very similar, right? We can find all the major families from the typical sample. You can find them in, in your sample generally at, at a pretty similar uh, level. One that I always look for in particular is that pink one, uh, the Pelagibacteraceae. Uh, this is a group, um, one of the one of the first members the group studied was called SAR11, S-A-R-11. Kind of wish they'd stuck with that name. It's easier to pronounce than <laughs> Pelagibacteraceae. Yeah. But in any case, this group, that's it's the most abundant group on natural coral reefs. It's well adapted for low nutrient conditions and it's a, a true bacteria plankton. It floats around in the water, free swimming in the water. Okay. That, that group, um, it takes time to develop in the tank. We never see that in a young tank, in a brand new tank. It always takes, takes time to get established. So I consider it a good marker, A, of you know, appropriate nutrient conditions, because it likes pretty low nutrients, and B, a good marker of, of maturity of the community. So because it's free swimming in the water column, this is probably something that gets taken out by like UV sterilizers quite a exactly bit. Exactly right. Yeah, that's that's the group that if you have a UV sterilizer, we generally find zero of this this group in your tank. That confused me a lot when I first started sequencing tanks and seeing that variation. But once we got enough data and and I was going through my Every now and then, I go through the database and ask questions like this, mm -hmm. um, and it just popped out that it was such a strong signal. It's something like a twenty-fold difference in the levels of that family. I mean, it's it's huge, um, and really, it's like most tanks that have UV just don't have any of that tank. It's an absence. Um, wow! And most tanks that don't have UV have that that group unless they're very young, you know, or or there's something else wrong with them, right? <clears throat> yeah, so that's a good example of the kind of thing that we're learning over time at Aquabiomics, really um, in collaboration with the reefing community, because you know I didn't set up all those tanks with and without UV sterilizers. Mm -hmm. You guys did, right? Yeah. And it was by having by having the community do that experiment and 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 run tests um, with us that that we were able to see that that difference. And it, it's uh, it's fun. I mean, we've actually been able to use that. I have a client, at least one client who's experimented by turning his UV on and off and seen it appear and disappear. Oh, in, very interesting. In response. Yeah. So it's a it's a good example of, you know, if we think about the the microbiome test report, or the microbiome as um, as having sort of a bunch of dials and a bunch of knobs on it. Right? The the dials are the indicators, the data that I'm giving you in the in the report. We would like to have a lot of knobs we could turn in response, where we could say, "Oh, I have too much of that group, so let me turn this knob and and dial it back down," or "I don't have enough of that group, let me turn this knob and dial it back up." Right. Um, and that's that's. Uh, that's what we're working towards. This is one of the examples of a very clear knob that the user can turn. If you turn on your UV, that pink bar will go away. And if you turn off your UV and add some water that contains that, that group, it will come back and recolonize your tank. So these are most common in like a successful reef tank or a, a nice healthy reef tank. So these are obviously more of the good bacteria. Uh, what's yeah, what's some of the the bad uh, bacteria that sure. that you could get? Yeah, and you know we can sometimes get a clue at that right at the stage where we're looking at the community composition. This this picture here, um, the kind of hot pink group at the bottom there. This family is called Vibrionaceae. Um, 
And the beginning of that word should sound familiar, Vibrio. I think most people in the hobby have heard of Vibrio. This is a <laughs> genus that includes a whole lot of pathogens, um, fish pathogens, um, coral pathogens, and there's even some human pathogens in there. So it's, it's a nasty group. Um, we sometimes see tanks that have an elevated level at the family level, you know, so there's a big hot pink bar in this graph and right away we can say, oh, look, there's a, um, there's likely to be pathogens. You have so much Vibrio. There's a couple other groups of pathogens that sometimes show up here too. But um, of course the real diagnosis of pathogens happens at the specific sequence level, not the family level. So we leave that towards the end of the report. If you want to scroll down, um, okay. I think you might've had some pathogens. I think you had uh, one fish pathogen and one suspected coral pathogen, right? Yeah, I believe so. And um, this is, this talks about your nitrifying community. So sure, uh, we can want to touch on this real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, okay. let's talk about this. So the nitrifying community, you know, this is a, this is a community that the, the reefing hobby, we knew about this, right? We, before, before, we ever came along at Aquabiomics, the reefing hobby already knew about the nitrifying community. It was probably what we knew most about. Um, and, you know, because there were publications on microbiology out there, we could kind of put names to the bacteria that must be doing this. But of course, we had no way of knowing which bacteria were doing it in your tank and were they there in your tank yet or, or not. Um, all we could see was the chemical effects. So, this was one of the one of the motivations for doing this testing in the first place. Um, we can break this this group nitrifying microbes down into two areas: the ammonia oxidizers and the nitrite oxidizers. One of the things that we've learned from this um, surveying of hundreds and hundreds of tanks is that ammonia oxidizers are consistently uh, more uh, they're present at higher levels than the nitrite oxidizers. They're more abundant in the reef tank um, and your sample you know fit this pattern exactly so we we saw more of this group than the other um, and it, it looks like we actually had pretty high levels in your towards towards the upper end of the normal range i guess so i'm the typical range over on the right hand side describes between i don't know i think the 10th and 90th percentiles something like that and so yours is towards the upper end of that range so um normal on the high end, very positive sign. One other thing I'll point out while we're looking at this table is um, this group of microbes, these are actually not bacteria at all. These are archaea. Um, and so people may some kind of sometimes wonder, why does he keep insisting on calling them microbes, not bacteria? Well, look, one of the most important bugs in your aquarium is not a bacteria, it's it's archaea. And that's that's actually the rule across the hobby, the dominant ammonia oxidizers are not bacteria. They are um, archaea in this group. Um, yeah, so the ammonia oxidizing part of the community looked very typical and, and good in your sample. Um, the nitrite oxidizers, I think, were low. Is that right? We did not detect any uh, in this sample. Um, now, these are surely present somewhere in an established tank. Um, but what these data indicate is that in your biofilm community and in, in your water community too, they're present at very low levels. You know, actually so low we didn't even detect them in this in this sample. Um, I was looking back at your first test. <clears throat> Remember, we tested we tested a sample from your tank previously, and the water filter part of it didn't work, so we we didn't have a good report. But the um, the swab sample actually worked fine that first time, and we did find nitrite oxidizers uh, that first time at, at very low levels. So, you know, really, I think the two tests are telling us the same thing. Nitrite oxidizers are at low levels in your system. Now, is that a problem or not? I always tell people it's only a problem if you're having issues controlling your nutrients or nuisance algae, because there are, there are other processes in the tank competing with nitrification for these nutrients. And so if, if we find low levels of these groups, it probably means they're not getting enough nutrients to, you know, rise to high levels. Um, 
that could be because of carbon dosing. I don't I don't recall if you do carbon dosing. It could be because of a macroalgal refugium or an algal skimmer. Do you have anything like that? Uh, yep, I do run a refugium. So there's yeah. some ketomorpha down there. Yeah, that's great. And I do too. It's not a criticism of those at all. It's just a discussion of kind of the interaction between different pieces of the system, right? If you have mm -hmm. two parts of the system competing for the same nutrient, you know, every time you turn on your, your light in your refugium and take up some nutrients out of the water, those are nutrients that the nitrifiers won't get. And so these, these communities can be lower um, mm -hmm. as a result. Sounds to me like it's not at all a problem in your system. Um, just something to be aware of. Um, you know, I, I run a refugium and my light bulb burned out recently. I just use a cheap, you know, grow, grow light. Yep. Bulb same here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The light bulb burned out. I started getting more algae than usual on my, on my glass in the display. Um, and it's an anecdote. I mean, I'm just telling a story and waving my hands, but I think it exists. I think it, um, it illustrates the, the process that I'm describing, this interaction, where if you don't have a high nitrifying community, when you turn off the light in your refugium, there's nobody else to take up the nutrients, or there's not, there's not enough of them, right? You can become dependent on whatever process you're using. And I think that's the case for any of those three processes, right? You know, um, whether it's carbon dosing or nitrification or macroalgal growth, um, the, the tank will become dependent on that process. And if you suddenly remove it, it would, um, it would take some time for the other processes to, uh, to grow to the point where they could, could take it out. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. So that's, that's one, the, well, that is the reason why they say like, don't just take all of your, uh, refugium away all at once. You want to harvest yeah. it out slowly and, so that that process stays going um, yeah yeah i definitely agree with that yeah. um you know and it part of the part of the lesson that we all learn in the hobby right that nothing good happens quickly if you're making changes yeah. make them gradually and slowly kind of wean your tank off of it yeah. awesome very cool dr eli thank you so much yeah thank you remember that a healthy reef tank starts with a healthy microbiome and now that you have the tools to help you understand yours, I have these two videos right here to help you take your reef keeping skills to the next level. Thank you so much for liking and subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one.